This is the last part to a massive three-part reaction I did to Worm Girls What Happens in Fear and Hunger 2 Termina full story analysis. If you haven't seen the first two parts of this reaction, links to them will be in the description and in the corner cards. Now, with all that out of the way, let's finally finish this. The sun is setting, so the four head back to the train for some rest and free goulash. Woo! Goulash! Karen holed up in a bookstore last night, but now the sun's up and she can snap some photos. Or at Whoa. least, that was the plan. It's interrupted when she hears a bottle break behind her and turns to see a mob of mutated townies closing in. Oh god. She ducks into a nearby apartment building to get away, only for the door to lock behind her. Uh... The place is covered in a white that... crust that almost looks like mold, and there's an uncanny atmosphere of still and quiet. Oh, like that the doesn't... whole building is sleeping. So either there's weird magic going on here, which again is, you know, very likely, or somehow those crazed people lured it moved her in here and locked the door from the outside, which I don't know which is more terrifying. But it isn't completely quiet. The sound of static spills down the hall, accompanied by flickering light. She slowly approaches, gun drawn. In the Sorry, I just I thought from my, my recent playthrough of Psychonauts. TV. TV. The new new god. In the middle of an open apartment, a TV is inexplicably on despite the power being out. Real TV. Rocking acts of crime in the heart of Prehavia. And she's reporting on it. Okay. Commentating the events here in Prehavia, Bohemia is Karen Sauer. Good afternoon. A murder so heinous and perplexing in all its particulars has never been committed in the city of Pehavio. The tragedy on 28th Street. Right. This most extraordinary and frightful affair that transpired here in the heart of the city baffles the residents of the apartment building to no end. The person charged with this crime is said to have never been a suspicious one. All the residents described him as a calm individual who liked to keep to himself most of the time. Regardless of his outward persona, Inside, this man was a monster. The residents of apartments 2, 6, 11, and 13 were murdered in the most gruesome manner. Oh, is that a code? Karen stares in stunned silence as the broadcast ends. That certainly looked like her on TV. I don't like her. She's never recorded a report about Preheville in her life. Yeah. She finds a set of keys in the manager's office and is able to use them to explore the apartments. At one point, she spots a disgusting monster wandering the halls. It looks like a worm or an intestine with huge fists like sacks of potatoes. A disgusting little tongue Ugh. darts out of one nostril as it sniffs the air. It's weird. This is a neighbor. I, again, I've said that they way too much in this video. To face solo. Their arms can punch for heavy damage and they have a life-draining tongue attack. Ugh. It's best to disable them with a rifle before moving in, or just use a shotgun to take them out without getting close. Just shoot them! How do you put down the horrors of the old gods? You shoot them! Neighbors also populate the sewers, and their clothes suggest that they were once human, which is a pretty disgusting fate for these unfortunates. Yeah, oh god. In one of the apartments on the upper floors, she comes across Don. The man is slumped in a chair, looking even more tired and defeated than usual. Oh yeah, on him. The floor next to him is a His wife sigil. was the weird sewn creature. She recognizes it, and she says she doesn't. The journalist knows shell shock when she sees it, and offers Don a lifeline. Come with me, she says. He can't muster a good argument against the idea, <laughs> so he joins her. There's a diary in the room, full of the scribblings of a madman. It appears to describe the serial murders mentioned in the strange television broadcast, which the killer has dedicated to his lord, Sulf... Sulf something. Sulf? The diary makes mention of a watch... Lord Sulfur! It's dripping blood and sealed with a combination lock, but between the broadcast and the diary, the pair have enough clues to decipher the combo. They open the washing machine only to discover a tunnel. With nowhere else to I'm go, the they machine. crawl inside. Karen and Don have not seen the wooden world outside of their dream, and both are terrified, not knowing what to make of the place. Actually, wait a second, that kind of actually reminds me. Just about like the tunnel and the washing machine. I think there was... I think there was like a Korean movie or something. I, was it Korean? I don't know. It was on one of those channels uh, where they um they like um uh, they synopsisize the video and they have like like a Microsoft Sam voice over the top just uh, reading out. But like there was this movie where like God, um his wife and like his son, not Jesus though. Was it Jesus? I don't know. It's been a while. But like 
um, the son or, or the wife, I forget who, um, but they left heaven through a tunnel that exited out from a, like, that ex whose exit was like a washing machine somewhere in the real world. It was really weird. I, I don't even think I'd be able to remember or find that video again if I tried. They progress through and find that it's a twisted reflection of the apartment building, but here, surprise, all surprise. look like prison cells. Within, they find decapitated bodies with pumps draining them of some strange purple liquid. Ugh. The entire place is patrolled by neighbors, who seem almost like prison guards, though they don't display any real intelligence. In the alternate version of the killer's room, they discover a statue of a fallen angel cradling a strange effigy of a tiny king sat on a massive throne. Oh, okay. It looks important, and there's nothing else here, so they nab it and head back. When they emerge from the washing machine with their prize, the door unlocks, freeing them from their moldy prison. Moldy prison? Down, spinning out. Even on a normal trip to Preheville, he'd have been miserable. But now he's worried he'll lose it completely once he finishes his last cigarette. Oh, Character God, we have another addict. Here and now as they head east, looking for any other survivors. So when the pair are attacked by a clown of all things, the clown! do is laugh. La, da, 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 he knows he's the crow mauler of Termina. He'll pop up all over town and slowly chase you down. So this is the crow mauler of this game, not the elephant. Okay, so let me look at, look at this. So he's a clown. He does not look very funny. He has one needle in one hand and like, what is that? A, what is that like a cane with several needles or like a whip or something? What is that? On his own, he's not usually a huge problem, but he has a habit of showing up at the worst possible times. Can you at least shoot him? Kill him? Encountering him in town before entering Tunnel 7 means that he won't kill Tanaka, but left to his own devices, he will track down and start to kill other contestants that you haven't recruited yet. Oh, okay. He some tableaus for you to find. Well, that's good. At least kill him soon so that they saved other people. That's definitely a good thing. It's it, though it, it, leaving him to live isn't even worse than just the regular Crow Mauler, because the Crow Mauler in the previous game just followed you and was a pain. <laughs> Deals moderate damage with his needle whip and can poison characters to add damage over time. The main problem is that he's pretty beefy and can really wear you down over several turns. You might be tempted to cut off one of his arms, but don't. The best strategy is to oh! avoid him. <laughs> I, I love the transition. Cut off one of his arms. Gun. <laughs> I gotta watch that again. I'm sorry. You might be tempted to cut off one of his arms, but don't. The best strategy is usually to Gun! I, I, I just- I love the suddenness of that. Needles whips out a pistol! Avoid him, but you can also throw glass at his head to blind him, then break his legs and take out his head. Don looks the body over. He's got blue paint on his face. Again, more blue! He's remarkably fit, but otherwise this seems to be nothing more than an ordinary human. Except... The medic realizes that the face staring up at him is none other than his father-in-law. Einar von Dutch, the man who killed his wife. Okay. So something is driving, driving people mad, and then it's like bringing them back as like super, super fit psychopaths or something like that? And again, what, what does the blue paint symbolize? The last Don saw of the man, he was dead, having sacrificed himself in some unknown ritual. He thought that was the end of it, but somehow a dead man got up and made good on his intentions to visit Preheview. <laughs> Blue paint gang, it's rise up! Where Karen would call him delusional, but after everything she's seen, why not? Again, like, all of these. Oh, right, I didn't even see that. But yeah, it's like all, all of these, like, fr super freaky and super strong, like people that have blue paints and for something involves them all being like super strong this is this is really weird they leave the dead clown behind making sure the job is finished this time then head for the other side saw off his head okay yeah that makes sure Marina places the hunger and martyr effigies on their pedestals but one is still missing that is until it walks through the door carried by dan and karen yay lots of people the group make their reintroductions and swap stories of what it, I'd be showing this off in engine if there wasn't a four person party limit. Drat, <laughs> RPG maker. Karen places hers on the pedestal. A hidden staircase in the floor opens, leading oh. down into the unknown. Wonderful. Osa senses a god in this church, but it sure isn't Almer. Whatever the priests were doing here, all the abominable things going on in the basement, 
They were done in the name of some unknown other god. There's an actual His god in this church? Spine. Oh no. The stairs lead to a tunnel that contains more of the snail monsters and a few pillar men. And the Great. contestants eventually come to a hidden chapel where a massive statue of Almer has been constructed. Only, that's not Almer. It's all wrong. Something is watching them from the scaffolding. Oh, it's Without this thing again. It leaps down and attacks. The circle, that's what it was called. Rance said the circle isn't the hardest boss in the game, mostly because you only have to break one of his limbs. He attacks twice for high damage with his spears, so it's best to try to race one of his arms down before they can kill anybody. You actually get one of his spears if you do, and it's a pretty decent weapon. That's wonderful. The beast withdraws, roaring that the contestants aren't the one that he's after. He curses humanity, saying that they've been meddling with things they shouldn't, and that it's causing all sorts of problems in the world. Of Despite course, because humanity... I mean, have you seen this universe? There are so many things we humans can get our grubby little fingers in and mess up. Fearsome attitude, Rancid would seem to be interested in ending the current chaos and restoring the world to its usual equilibrium. He mentions a few interesting that things that are easy to miss. One, the doppelgangers are coming into existence. Two, the dead gods are being brought back. Doppelgangers? Three, that the source of all this trouble is people misappropriating the power of the moon. He then misappropriating off, the power the of the moon? Baffled. Wait, so... It's been said that, like, the old gods have left. I don't I don't think there was anything said about any of them still being here. They're either left or dead. And the, the only things that's left are, like, remnants of them. That Like, they're... They're not really the whole, they're just like little pieces that are still as powerful as the whole thing because, you know, old gods. Could that be the same thing with the moon? Like this, I'm forgetting the name now, this moon god. This whole thing is going on because somebody's using the power of the moon god and that's why you've had three of these consecutive, like, festivals, quote unquote, um, happening, like, one after the other. Oh, okay, and dead gods coming back to life. I, I mean... I guess you could, yeah, the god, could you classify the, the god of, of fear and hunger as that? Because she, like, appropriated the god of the depths power, at least I think that's what she did. Oh, so weird. The exit leads to the temple district, a place where only the city's clergy are normally allowed. Okay. It's patrolled by Belen, so suggestively shaped monsters that wield iron spears. Bell ends. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Of course. Yes. Bell ends can rapidly deal damage by strangling people with their free hand. I just, I love how, like, in some monsters you've had, like, censorship of some areas or, like, blurring. No, in this area, in this, like, area, you just can't see the entire monster. You just can't. YouTube will not allow it. Oh. <sighs> Okay, now I'm curious. I actually want to see what these things actually look like. Okay, I'm going to be completely honest here. Uh, she did not need to censor out this entire thing. I mean, obviously there is a rather obvious um, area that should be censored, but the rest of it is just sort of, you know, standard. There's nothing really explicit about it. I mean, why'd she have to do the entire thing? That's kind of weird. I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it actually was. And that should always be targeted first. They can also boost their defense in combat. My preferred strategy is either to shoot them or to spend the first turn destroying their dangerous arm, then retreat to reset their stat buffs, re-engage, destroy the other arm, and then destroy the torso at your leisure. Okay. The Great Tower rises to the north, but it's giving Marina a bad feeling. Karen wants to have a look at it, so the groups decide to split up. Abella heads west with her crew, and Don and Karen are again down to two. Oh god, this doesn't look foreboding at all. Ah, look at it! It is the Kaiser! Torments intense war is emanating from the figure in yellow. Ah, yes. The Kaiser! Not just a normal human being. Oh, hey, look who it is! Kaiser! Lieutenant Pablo Yudin draws his pistol, looking down the sights at a pale man in a yellow robe. This is Kaiser, ruler of the Bremen Empire, and Pav has come here, rising through the ranks in the Bremen army, trying for years to get this close to the man. If 
by wasting for this opportunity. Yeah, I, I doubt that your revenge is gonna work, dude. This guy's either God or already a zombie. They share a few terse words, and Pav pulls the trigger. Nothing happens. That is to say, the gun goes off, but the bullet doesn't seem to do anything to Kaiser, who casually draws his sword and slashes through Pav with a oh! vicious counterattack. Okay! The lieutenant drops like a rock, and Kaiser keeps walking. Karen and Don rush to the wounded man's side. He's still alive, and Don is able to staunch the bleeding, though he'll need Karen a hospital if he's to last more than a day or two. Wonderful. There's nothing at the tower but a bunch of impaled corpses, and it's giving the pair the most terrible feeling. Writing on the statues flanking the tower makes it clear that, as Porcala said, the way up will only appear when all but one of the fourteen are dead. Okay. Nobody's eager for that to happen. So they pick up the lieutenant and gingerly haul him back to the train. Pav was born in Voronia, now part of the Eastern Union. Years ago, the Bremen army invaded his homeland, and he lost his family in the fighting. So Pav dedicated his life to revenge, finding his way to Bremen, joining the army, and waiting for his chance to kill Kaiser. But there's a danger in playing the part. Pop couldn't get to where he's at today without becoming an active member of the war machine that he hated. Yeah. He was there into the abyss for so long before you too become a war criminal. There's a house on the way over, and Marina has a feeling they should stop in. Really? The walls are painted an odd shade of blue inside, and it's filled with replicas of priceless antiques. Wait, replica? Again, the replicas of like the replicas. What is with this? The recurring theme: blue. So this is obviously some sort of base with the weird blue painted s murder killer psychopath people but then what is with the constant like replicas of like actual art and stuff like that this is the home of father donovan hugo who levi and company left splattered all over the orphanage oh wonderful As marina suspected the man knew something yeah there are notes scattered all over the floor at first they seem incoherent but as she puts them together they begin to tell a somewhat insane story Donovan visited the legendary city of Mahabd in his dreams, and he was desperate to return there. Okay. Mahabd was not originally the domain of the new gods, he writes, nor of men. It had a king who ruled over it like the sun, and all the people stood under that same sun in unity. He also speaks of a different sun. One well, yeah, because it said that the, the Mahabra, if that's how you pronounce it, was like the city of the gods, and then humans took it. And now burns cold in a pit underground. He seems to believe that one day the original sun will return, and so will that legendary king. What does that even mean? Unfortunately, Donovan's plans were foiled when he had the dream. He must mean the Termina dream, and he writes as though he knew what it was. Like Father Domek, he knew what was coming. He may have even had a hand in it, but he was ultimately destroyed by it. Thousands of people are dead, Sulfur but there's sons. at least a tiny bit of justice in the world. Marco and Tanaka return to the train with a gift for Olivia. A wheelchair. Oh! Now she can scoot around and see what's going on for herself. Wait, did the police officer help them get a pol- get- did the mu- did the mutated police officer help them get a wheelchair? Okay, at least there's still some good. Marco refuses to let her go alone, and Tanaka decides to keep an eye on Samari and Bob. Oh, Tanaka, you're here. Karen and Don tag along. And the four decide to visit the jazz club that Marina mentioned. Why was the entire thing blurred? It turns out that Don makes a mean cocktail, and it's the first time any of them have felt at ease in a while. Don's cocktails are so good, in fact, that they refill your mind whenever you ask him for one. Oh, okay. Wonderful. With Hendrik at the restaurant and Don here, HP is really your only resource to manage. And even that goes away if you learn a healing spell. <laughs> Imagine that. You can get to the point... If you play the game correctly, you can get to the point where the... The titular mechanics of fear and hunger are no longer an issue. Oh, you gotta love it when that happens. Just don't tell Henrik about this place, or he'll poison the food and kill everyone. Wait, what? This is a battle royale, after all. Oh yeah, he's the only- is he one of the ones that's actually going after it, right? Olivia notices the flicker of blue moths around the half-open trap door and climbs out of her chair to check it out. Karen follows, Just ignore and Annabelle. what must be an NLU hideout. The name jumps out at Olivia. It really feels like her sister's been reaching out to her somehow, trying to lead her somewhere. Yeah. But how? And for what? 
Karen notices the map on the board and suggests that the group check out whatever the NLU was interested in. These are the good guys, she says. If the group can find any of them, they might be a big help. Having to climb a ladder like that. And oh. that's how everybody wound up in the sewer, following scummy walkways that the NLU must have used to sneak around. Great. Tucked away beyond a series of pumps, they find a ladder that descends a long way down into natural caverns beneath the city. If you bring Abella this way, she'll comment that the convoluted layout of the sewers suggests that they might be very old. Yeah, and that they could have catacombs, been catacombs. Or, yeah, exactly. Never mind. That should feel familiar if you've played the first game. Oh no. As the group heads further, ah, the, rat man. Depths, the smell of sewage is replaced by something else. Oh no. Sulfur, a stink like rotten eggs. Okay. Okay, now we're getting other things. Sulfur. I mean, I said sulfur earlier. This as a joke because, like, Lord so and that was the first word that came to mind, but now it's actually becoming a thing? But Olivia can still see the butterflies, which lead them down a side passage and into a massive open cavern. I think this is a Grogroth statue based on the face on its chest. Osa says something similar on his out- has something similar to it on his outfit, and yellow mages are associated with Grogroth, yeah, because they're purely transactional, yeah. Something is approaching in the dark. Something big. Oh. It's Whoa. a gigantic, three-eyed wolf with teeth that protrude from its mouth. Oh, it's God. And snapping as it approaches. It has swords stuck it's in moonless. its back. She's grown a lot over the last 350 years. I'm sorry, and what? It, it's moonlight. Protrude from its mouth, snarling and snapping as it approaches. It's moonless. Moonless? She's what? grown a lot over the last 350 years. Wow, and now okay. That's our problem. Wait, I thought. Wait, I thought Moonless had six eyes. Originally, not four. Am I just misremembering that? No, yeah, okay, never mind. I was misremembering. Moonless is did in fact have four eyes before. Man, you got big. She attacks with her front paws, so it might be worth breaking those. But don't forget to poison and burn her torso or head. And while you're at it, attack the katana on her back until it falls off. You can't get miasma from her, but you can get black steel, which is a really nice melee weapon. Miasma. And don't worry, despite the battle graphics, the contestants haven't really hurt her. Once she takes enough damage, August, as long as he's alive, leaps in to save the day. August? He manages to calm the beast down and Who she is this again? Off. He refers to Moonless as a friend of the family, and says that the contestants aren't the ones they're after. He also offers some medical supplies by way of apology. Oh, okay. So what the hell was Thank that you. about? The contestants are clueless. But this is a point where we the players can draw some inferences. Okay. We last saw Moonless leaving the Dungeons of Fear and Hunger with Rognavaldr, who wielded black steel and must have taken miasma as well. August called her a family friend, implying that the man has some connection to the medieval monster killer. There's a concrete passageway here leading to a pair of elevators. Okay. They're both unpowered, but it's possible to climb up or down their cables. On the lowest level, they find some kind of military installation. This must have been built by the Eastern Union. The well, this is the one you can find earlier in the game, I, get, I bet. Well, who are you? And then there's... Oh! Tanaka? I don't think Tanaka's head can do that. He's not part owl, is he? Buddy? Oh. Uh. Then I swallow you whole. Tanaka's oh. doppelganger is a pretty easy fight. There are a few doppelgangers scattered around the game, and they serve more as minor spooks than anything. Oh, that's creepy. Rancid said that they were a product of people leeching on the moon, that the forces of the universe are trying to correct for all the shenanigans that have gone on here in Preheville. It, all mouth. The, the lipstick cost must be enormous. But they look a little... underbaked. <laughs> in any event, under a microscope here. Nobody knows just what it is, but Olivia has a feeling about it. The moths wouldn't have let her here for nothing. She activates the machine. Okay. So now we have three of these things. Climb upward and leads to another bunker entrance. Here, the group discovers what turns out to be the foundation of the church. Oh. There's a book by Father Hugo here. Foundations which takes of a few Decay. Of Enki, suggesting a schism in modern theology. Enki's matter of fact understanding on one side, and Donovan's looser, more transcendental interpretation on the other. These catacombs are ancient. If Marina's brought down here, she'll indicate that they might be around 2,000 years old dating from the earliest settlement in this area. Jeez, There's also okay. an elevator that heads up to the church basement, meaning that Hugo and Domek must have been involved with whatever the Eastern Union was doing with that machine. Mm -hmm. Karen can hardly contain herself. Proof. Concrete proof of a conspiracy. She's got it. There's always the one. You gotta love it. Father as they try to leave the church, and against all advice, Karen tries to interview it. 
It can't speak, but as its bottomless green eyes stare at her, she feels its presence invading her mind. It shows oh. her images of an impossible shape, an unknown god trapped in a pit of burning sulfur. Can't it sulfur! It drives her mad, but Olivia shoots the thing dead and the four are able to escape. Olivia, by the way, is surprisingly comfortable with a Oh, yeah, just kill it. While the others view them as tools, she feels an uncanny affinity for them. It's almost... Wait, strange. what? While the others view them as tools... So I, I love how, like, the attacks... How this, how this worked. Because, like, you give this... You give this girl a weapon, and her attack stat goes from 80 to 999. That is an upgrade, if I've ever seen one. She feels an uncanny affinity for them. It's almost sensual. Perhaps it's That's because weird. they restore power that her body has been robbed of. Or perhaps it's something more. About the God of Guns is upon us! Bella and her group run into August in the Maiden Woods. There's still a point of interest out here to investigate, and the city's still extremely dangerous, so now's as good a time as any for a break. Hopefully, yes. Following the smell of smoke, they discover the man resting at a small campsite. Abella is a fellow old guardian. And they share a few words about the home country before he decides to tell them a story. Home country. 350 years ago, the world was in a terrible state. The powers that had led it out of the Dark Ages had slumped into corruption and decay. But there was a prophecy that a certain man would bring about a new era of prosperity and peace. Yeah, we've heard of him. That man would arise, becoming a hero to the people as he fought against the kingdoms of his day. But he realized that to fulfill his prophecy, he would need more power. So he went down power. a very dark path. Let me guess, 1.21 gigawatts. Pricing everyone and everything he had to achieve it. But in the process, he inadvertently created the conditions for a different power to arise. The god of fear and hunger. Yeah. And her influence led people to sweep away the old order. The man eventually found strength in the darkness, but it cost him everything. And when he emerged, ready to wield it, the opportunity had passed him by. That didn't stop him from trying. He raised up an army and spread chaos across Europa, becoming known as a monster and a villain, the Yellow King of Madness. In the end, he returned to the darkness. But there was a problem. The prophecy was never fulfilled, and so the story goes, in his madness, his belief in the prophecy prevents him from finding rest. To this day, he continues to wander the earth in search of his greater good. And that's, the, and that's Kaiser, okay. From what I, I'm understanding of this, because in the previous video, she did say that there was some wiggle room for how certain events lead into the actual, like, canon events that lead up to uh, Fear and Hunger 2. So it could either be he was brought back from the dead by um, his lieutenant that loved him, which I'm, I'm forgetting her name, unfortunately, and just the process left him wrong, or he actually did transcend to become a god, but you know, it the the transcend the transcension the ascension process again changed him. I uh, gotta love it. All good stuff is coming up here. The group leaves the campsite and heads back to Tunnel Seven, where Marina and Abella initially met. Oh, okay. This time, there's nothing to fear down here. Woo! Wonderful. They turn on the computer and head back to the city. Both groups convened at the last of the marked destinations. The ah. Museum. Here, a deformed butler named Jeeves tells them they're invited to join in the festivities. Oh, hey, Jeeves! As expected, something is terrible. Long time no here. see. The attendees, dressed in elaborate costumes, seem to be pantomiming a party. Their mouths and hands move, but they make no sound, robotically going through the motions of a high-class celebration. Okay. There are various artifacts here, and if you're playing as Osa, Nasra will comment on them, filling in a little more backstory. Okay. Most importantly, wait, so is this why there were so many like fake artifacts before they were all stolen and brought here? Is that what's going on? We get an answer as to Mahab's original inhabitants. The place appears to have been plundered by archaeologists to Mahab's original inhabitants. Most importantly here, we get an answer as to Mahab's original inhabitants. Oh, the place appears to have So wait, yeah, Mahab's original inhabitants weren't humans, but were they not gods? Have been plundered by archaeologists in this day and age. It's yeah. artifacts now fodder for museums like this one. Of course, yeah. The wall As you carving do. Donovan obsessed over. The one he'd seen in his dreams of the ancient city is here. But it looks quite a bit different. Dated to 20,000 years ago, oh. it depicts reptilian beings, not humans. And a helpful placard explains that these are the nine chromatic blights. 
Mahab's original inhabitants were the lizard men seen in the first game, who became creatures called blights rather than new gods. At some point in prehistory, humanity conquered Mahab, overthrew its king, and drove its people out to languish and eventually die off. Okay, so the ascension process turned, okay. The new gods have always failed because that role was never meant for humanity. We stole our place in the Great Hall, tore down the reptilian idols and erected our own. Every failure since has been a failure of the human race to live up to its precursors. Okay, so um, it seems literally everything that's gone wrong in this world is because humanity stole stuff from the lizard men. I, again, you, you're, this, this game, I swear, you're mixing stuff like Lovecrafting horror, um, like but just regular body horror. Uh, now you're mixing in like, um, like the conspiracy theories with the lizard people with a dash of, oh, they were the precursors and stuff went wrong because we took their place. Okay. Okay. Huh. There's more though. We learned that in Abyssonia, worship of the old gods was taboo until recently. The Songhai Empire always viewed them as extraterrestrials, well, okay. beings from beyond the blue sky. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are no they, they, they are not old gods. They are aliens. <laughs> Ancient aliens. Oh, God. The answer's here. Everything we learn just raises more questions. Yes, it All does. All we can do is move on. What was I saying just literally about how the, the lore of this game is just so many random things mushed together? This is... I, I don't want... I, I've said... The, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. I've said, the, I've said the word weird way too many times in this recording. The goal of the party is to find the attendees that Jeeves clued the group in on and speak to them. They repeat phrases about the date and time. It's 135 in the month of sulfur, apparently, month and by entering that information into this clock, we can proceed. The Eastern Union tried to bury the oh, logic you can roll downstairs. they pulled out. Logic was considered expendable if it meant an end of the war. Logic? And so they handed Preheville to Kaiser on a silver platter. So this logic project, logic project, uh, was seemingly more, or no, less important. Oh, never mind. I'm not going to try to put a hierarchy to these things. Considering it a cheap price for peace. Going down in the hole. Nothing, nothing. What the NLU found when they arrived was that the Bremen invaders had immediately seized the tunnels and began excavating this place. The White Bunker. The White Bunker. Abella inspects the terminal. All three telectroscopes are now online, it says. The vault door swings open. Oh god, there's some sort of weird scientist. Now they decide who will go. Olivia is adamant. If Rayla's in there, she has to go see her. Marco won't let Olivia go it alone. Osa came here to learn the truth. And there seems to be no better place. Abella has a mission to complete. Goodbyes are made and the four venture into the bunker. The vault door clangs shut behind them. It will not open again. Oh, wonderful. Point of no return. Who you take down here is up to you, of course. But it's a difficult path, so you might want to come prepared. There are Bremen elites everywhere, and they're very powerful. The flame troopers can even instantly kill you if you're not careful. Oh, great flamethrower. There's something strange about these guys, like stranger than normal for Bremen soldiers. If Don is along, he'll comment that there's something uncanny about them, but he can't quite Me? put his finger on it. Of course, Kaiser, being the head of our stand-in for Germany in the Second Great War, has cooked super up some soldiers. sort of tiny super soldier program. Great. These are probably marriages. Under the right conditions, sometimes Sylvian will find two beings showing each other an act of physical love and will merge them together into one gestalt being. Right, yeah, I forgot marriage. Yeah, I talked about them earlier. Marriage is the merging of two or sometimes more beings into one and it, and they're just, you know, stronger and better than the two combined. The two original parts. 
stronger than either of its constituent parts. That's the proper wording for it's it. It's best to shoot them. There's plenty of ammo down here, and it turns what could be a slog into something of a victory <laughs> You just shoot them. Olivia is not to be played with. Logic, per documentation scab. Yeah, they may be super soldiers, but they're not bulletproof. But around the bunker, uses the lucid dreams of its occupant to link together a collective unconscious that unites everyone in the range of the telectroscopes. I'm sorry, together, what? Per documentation scattered around the bunker, uses the lucid dreams of its occupant. Lap. Olivia is not to be played with. Logic, per documentation scattered around the bunker, uses the lucid dreams of its occupant to link together a collective unconscious that unites everyone in the range of the telectroscopes. The papers appear to be describing something halfway between a home computer and a machine god. Okay, so, um, I, so I was saying something earlier about the uh, hydron, uh, the, the particle accelerator, um, creating a god instead of a black hole. Um, I mean, I guess in a certain point of view, I was sort of right, but no, they're, they're making a machine god. I mean, humanity already accidentally made one god. How's this one? And it made the age of cruelty. How, what's going to happen if this thing wakes up? Human creation that will solve the human dilemma. There are many strange sights in the bunker. Here, they find a bizarre attempt at making a chimera uh -huh. with hooves and a snake tail. Ooh. Poor thing. There, a massive arm reaches gently skyward, as if just awakening. Ooh. In That's not creepy at all. Life, they encounter them. Oh my god! The Sylvian Trooper and the Platoon. So, okay, so Sylvian Trooper is, you know, gimp and rubber fetishist. And then we have this thing, a mass of, like, a turtle made out of a mushed together bunch of humans with a tank gun out sticking out the front. Okay, I know what I'm putting in the thumbnail. The platoon is a human hydra, sort of a mass marriage of intermingled human flesh. Normally, such creatures can't do much, but either through occult expertise or some mechanical innovation, Kaiser's forces have managed to make a bunch of people into a tank. Complete with an embedded artillery cannon. <laughs> I love that sentence. Has managed to merge a bunch of people together into a tank. That sentence is absolutely horrifying. The Sylvian Trooper explains that this is the last hurrah of the marching men of Night's Day. That soon they won't be needed anymore. And this is all just one final chance to indulge in the mindless destruction of the Cruel Age. Okay. This is a hard fight. The best thing to do is to take out the Sylvian Trooper by attacking her torso, as she will order the platoon to fire. Whenever it does, you're forced to flip a coin. Failure almost always means death unless you have a hardened heart equipped, and guarding won't protect you here. <laughs> fire! <laughs> I believe I remember a story from the Second World War about a crew in a Sherman. Uh, like, a German soldier came out and was about to shoot them with, like, a Panzerfaust. Um... And at the time, uh, the only thing they had uh, ready to fire was the main gun. So that they fired that because the machine gun wasn't ready yet. And um, the man, in their own words, disappeared. He ceased to exist. Um, I would, I would totally imagine that a what looks to be a very high-velocity anti-tank gun out of the the face of this creature um, would be very deadly against a very squishy and unarmored normal human. Through a combination of guts, poison, magic, and sheer firepower, the four smash their way through. Now, to get to the bottom of this. Hmm. Oh god, it takes up the entire hall. Darkness they find themselves in the Hall of Giants from their dream. Oh, okay, really? Their minds are almost overwhelmed by what they see. Finally? But they pick up a chorus of whispers. Climax? Finally. Climax, death of innocence, birth of the true god. Humanity sheds its skin. Okay. So whatever is going on here, they want it to happen. These former new gods, as it was said in the Fear and Hunger One video, that uh, the, it it basically came to the point where all of them knew that they were in a trap created by the old gods. 
and this uh, and the the new god like ascension apotheosis process never worked because it wasn't designed for humans in the first place what is this being that we humans are creating we creating our own physical god we had our own god before in the form well, actually two technically if you count almer but he was also technically created by the old ones fear and hunger was the first gods for humans and led to the creation of the of the cruel age and let humans massively uh, speed up their um uh their technological progress but what would this this thing do these are the new gods whose long and contentious history has all been building towards hey, kaiser world. the static hisses again and the four are drawn deeper in here they find the man behind everything man behind the slaughter kaiser the yellow king lagard lagard Are you gonna move? Can you walk? Roll? We're late, you know. Wait. Of course, the, the prophecy about Lagarde was that he would bring in a new era. So, after he failed to do it originally with the birth of the God of Fear and Hunger, prophecy would still continue. It just would be at a different time at a different with a different age oh, okay birth of a new god logic the machine is on, the machine god is online <laughs> that is a cruel joke that f that is a cruel joke the fate has played on me time and time again one point in time i did think i would be the one to lead us all to the promised land my ego led me to believe i would be the one true god worshipped in the coming age lagard was forced to abandon his ego in what he calls the dark green and learn to embrace chaos dark now green. he's put together a plan that will allow humanity to break the cycle it's been trapped in by shrugging off the gods entirely through the use of logic a god machine that will unite the collective unconscious of the species and bring it into the next age. Oh, That's what I was forced okay. to admit the idea might actually work where the last two ascensions and every attempt by the new gods have failed. But he'll be damned if he's going to let a prick like Lagarde be in charge of it. Yeah, just, hey, if you want to get out of the, the plot to keep humanity down by the old gods, just bypass it entirely! But Lagarde isn't in charge of it. He was supposed to be. But for the second time in his very long existence, he was beaten to the punch. Olivia's sister, Rayla, head of the Bohemian chapter of the Nameless Liberty Underground, infiltrated the White Bunker and activated logic herself to prevent Kaiser from getting his hands on it. Oh, okay! He's here now only as its guardian. The project will succeed regardless of who's at the helm. And he's made peace with the situation. But the oh. machine god is still weak while it comes online. Seriously, and a any safe, dude? could have unintended consequences. The four contestants cannot be here, so he raises his sword and the battle begins. Kaiser superficially resembles the Yellow King from the first game, and apparently the resemblance was enough for a lot of people to call it there. But the Yellow King only ascends an ending C of the first game, the happy ending, the ending where everything goes well. In ending C, the guards survived, defeated all the new gods, took all their souls, which would have prevented Enki and Ragnavaldr from doing their S-endings in the process, and sat on the throne, where he became some super powerful being who's better than all the new gods and he's able to come back and save the world from evil and establish a perfect kingdom forever. Fear and Hunger is not that story. No, of course this is it isn't. where the greatest plans of mice and men wind up broken and bleeding in the mud. This is a story about shame and suffering and perseverance in spite of it. Oh! Lagarde died in the dungeons, and a love-struck, misguided Dars performed a dark ritual that brought him back as a skinless abomination, a creature that would come to be known as a vampire. Oh! He's a vampire, Lagarde okay! Got the power he wanted, just not in the way he wanted it. Instead of mounting the throne and entering the green light, he died, and his soul went somewhere much worse. The, the ritual green. that brought him back was successful, but he wasn't the same. When mankind breached the ancient city of Mahab and first took the throne from the lizards, they fractured the world. An ape with the power of a god is still just an ape, still a slave to its basest survival instincts. 
And so, millennia of infighting, corruption, decay, and war plagued the world until the ascension of a man named Almer. Almer was perfect, and men are not. For Almer to achieve that state of divinity, he had to lose an equal part of himself. The other side of the coin. Human half. But the lost half wasn't destroyed. It was merely cast into the sulfur pits, where it still lies, bound and broken, hating everyone and everything, and most of all, yearning for freedom. So that's the sulfur. So that's the sulfur that we've been constantly hearing about. It's... Oh, God, okay. So again, this is... Okay, so this is talking about... So obviously there's like the, the obvious parallels between you know, Jesus again, because, you know, Almer. But the whole thing with Jesus was that he was equal parts man and divine. And that's, you know, that's part of like the religion. He was us. But in Fear and Hunger, Almer had to shed his human half. But the human half didn't die. And it became its own thing that's... God, that is disturbing looking. It does not look happy in the slightest. Oh, wow. And so I'm guessing that in this universe, the, the Jesus allegory shed its human part, and then the human half of the Jesus allegory became the devil of this universe. Oh, okay. So is that why everything's so messed up? Great. And so, when the Western world rallied around Almer, his counterpart, the sulfur god seethed in the frigid fire of his cage, gnawing at the roots of the goodness and order it was denied. Almer had the love of humanity, who saw him as one of them. But nothing could be further from the truth. Was not the broken and hateful counterpart, powerless in its prison, far more human than Almer's remote perfection? And so some, knowing the truth, quietly turned their worship from Almer's grace to the Sulphur God, spilling blood and spreading chaos in his name. There's the blue people. The guard was similarly split in two, and the bloody creature that crawled out of his skin had abandoned its ego in the dark green, becoming something more and less than human in the process. Oh, okay. But he kept his ambition, and for his plans, he would still need the support of the people. So he simply passed himself off as the god he had failed to become. Dressed in yellow with a false skin, wielding the sword and serpent that would symbolize his power, he tried desperately to fulfill the prophecy that he still believed. Oh. And once again, he failed. People had a new god to worship, and it wasn't him. Worse, he gained a reputation as a monster. So he retreated into the shadows, infiltrating governments and churches across Europa, spreading his influence everywhere he could, and, it would seem, sharing the secrets of his immortality with a select few. And that's At where you point, get the he, the messed up blue people that just that came back from the dead. Oh. Even began collaborating with the latest crop of new gods, and may have even sealed the heartless one away for opposing him. The general public wasn't totally unaware of this. The sword Sabbath was designed by the Vatican to defend the church from vampire hunters in the 17th century. Wait, it was designed by? Oh, okay, it's a cross. Okay, I just. But it was designed by the Vatican to protect it from vampire hunters. Okay. While the hunters never got their man, they appear to have at least been successful in forcing him to operate more quietly, as he and the new gods fade from history after that, only mentioned briefly by outlandish fringe theorists. Every so often, the festival of Termina comes. During this festival, the moon god Rare shows his face, reflecting the green light of the void down to Earth to force a set of contestants to fight each other whether they want to or not. But this green light does more than mutate people's bodies. It seemingly warps reality wherever it goes. Yeah. Enter the Cult of Sulphur. Though their god is locked away and seems to wield no power, they have learned to leech divine energy from the others. Kaiser and the new god spent centuries concocting logic and orchestrating global politics to see the project toward its completion. The Sulphur Cult would be the key to getting it all to work. By predicting and harnessing the reality-warping effects of Termina, they could go beyond the limits of technology to merge man and machine and birth a god from the collective unconscious of millions. Oh, okay. I... Uh, there's There are so many moving pieces to this. Originally... So, the Sulphur... So... Lo this logic... To making, like, this logic god... 
of course, you know, logic is the bane of religion, quote unquote. <laughs> but so it's the 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 sulfur cult is the one that's stealing power from if from the moon god to try to empower the sulfur god. But then they're being tricked by the people using logic so that their plan so that they so that they can use the power of the moon to like harmonize every uh, every human subconscious and make their god okay okay and so they put the dark rituals war machines and men of science to work all of europa whether they knew it or not was working day or night to see it through their efforts reflected in the wooden world a manifestation of the new collective unconscious Oh, okay. okay. Kaiser's not a hard fight. The, the the collective unconscious. Wood. Take out his sword arm, throw some dots on his torso. You know the drill by now. Once defeated, the guard slumps forward and melts into goo, just like Domek. Wonderful. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Nasra is furious. Once again, he's gotten away. The guard is now likely regenerating in a flesh pillar of his own. A soul anchor, probably made from what's left of Dars, the woman uh. who loved him, along with however many unfortunates who've been added to the pile over the centuries. Oh! Okay. But the way forward is open. There's nothing left to do but drink a few blue vials, equip your best magic gear, and go inside. Okay, we're Set fighting the machine thing god on now. Fire immediately. It's immune to poison, but burning will help you chew through its gigantic HP total very quickly. There are also these coolant pods at the bottom. Whenever they pop up, destroy them. Logic will unleash an attack in a few turns if they're still up, and it hurts. Oh, okay. Other than that, you've only got to worry about Red Ark and Moth Swarm. They deal decent damage, but you should be able to heal it off. Pet pills, vials, use everything you've got here. This is it. She has a second form if you take too long, and it's quite a bit harder. The right hand will cast oh. destruction magic while the left hand heals. Logic, it would seem, might be prepared to take over for Sylvian and Grogoroth. Okay, well, I mean, granted, that's kind of what the purpose of it would sound like, so I guess. Eventually, victory will come. And when it does, the case opens a little, and we finally see her. Rayla, reborn as the machine goddess Logic. All this time, she's been leading us here. If that little blue-faced jerk Perkala hadn't interrupted our dream, the game would have been over in the first five minutes. Oh, okay. She calls out to her twin. Join me, she says. I found a way for us to always be together. Oh. Olivia can only crawl forward and embrace her sister. The botanist finds herself floating in the artificial green. The artificial a new green. divine force by and for humanity. Rather than groveling at the feet of indifferent old gods or taking whatever scraps of power are left by an ancient race, humanity has finally, through its own efforts, achieved a form of divinity. And that's ending A. Everyone who is still alive outside of the bunker is shown escaping Preheviel on the train. They'll surely be scarred by what they saw here. I would imagine! With the consensus online, it's likely that Rare's influence won't last at Preheviel. But who's to say? What happens next is a mystery. Sure to be explored in Fear and Hunger 3. Oh god, so... Hum so, this wasn't just the case of, you know, humanity finally having its own god. This was humanity making its own god. And we're not even done. She said this was ending A. I would think maybe the good ending, but I don't know. At the time of this recording, only endings A, B, and C exist. The other two are fairly straightforward, but getting them can be a pain. I would, okay. To achieve ending B, simply do what Perkala asks of you, and kill all the other contestants. They move around, and tracking them down can be difficult, but the fights themselves are usually pretty easy. Some of them will actually die or kill each other without your help. Neil okay, so that's... So literally, the ending B is just, you know, do what the crazy person tells you, tells you and kill everyone. ...and a hand in this regard, picking some of them off as time goes by. When the 14 have become one, simply head for the tower and go on up. Burkala greets the player and tells them what we already know. Rare is gone. He's been gone for a very long time. What's left is merely an echo that still holds great power. Of so course, yes. It's just an echo or a shard of the original god that's still here. 
Arkala and his fellow sulfur cultists decided to make use of it, seeking out the most vicious and bloodthirsty people they could to join their ranks. For the B route, the player must either turn down his recruitment offer or fail to kill all the contestants before the third day. Falling short of Pedicolo's expectations means that the only prize left for the final contestant to claim is their freedom. Oh. And Pedicolo is the last obstacle. Okay. Pedicolo can reflect magic when his wings are folded, but outside of that, he's not too bad. He doesn't have a ton of hit points, just keep hammering on him. Once he's dead, the contestant is officially won, attracting the attention of what's left of the old god himself. He's... That again, that uh, the major the the whole the like, moon staring down at you. This has major Majora's Mask energy. I'm guessing ending C is actually killing everybody and accepting. Ah! What was I saw? Tremendous amount of hit points and will hammer you with attack magic every turn while as many eyes drain your sanity. Okay, never mind. I was gonna say, oh no, Majora's Mask, he's gonna kill us. But no, it's literally the boss fight as the moon comes down, like, and you have to hit his nose or something. You'll need all your buffs. And even then, it's best to oh. go for the eyes first, just so you don't get completely wrecked. Biblically accurate. Bear doesn't die when you defeat him. In fact, it's likely that you weren't even fighting him at all, as your character appears to simply be having a seizure on top of the tower as the sun rises over Preheview. Oh, okay. Following the ending... You'll be treated to a reminder that nobody but your character got out of Preview in one piece. And then you'll get a little photograph and an epilogue detailing the return to the mundane world. Mm -hmm. Personally, I find these endings interesting for developing an understanding of the character, but they all ring a little hollow to me. At least the happy ones do. It's hard to swallow a feel-good or even a feel-neutral epilogue after murdering a baker's dozen of these cute little characters. <laughs> yeah. Ending C is nearly identical to ending B. All that's required is that all the contestants die before day three. Pergola will commend your ruthlessness and invite you to join the Cult of Sulphur. How do you join? Well, you die and get cast into the Sulphur Pit, of course. Oh, is that all? There, direct exposure to the infinite hatred of the Sulphur God will burn away everything weak in you. And someday, you might be able to claw your way out of the pit, reborn as an ubermensch, freed from the shackles of guilt and morality. Oh, You'll be joining that the all? of the blue-painted slasher villains who stalk Europa, going absolutely ham on people for kicks. If you agree, the fight with Percola proceeds as before, but victory leaves both parties bleeding out atop the tower. As your character slips away, we're given a brief glimpse of the Sulphur God. A helpless, limbless slab of meat, tortured forever in a prison of freezing flame. The end. Freezing flame, Logic eh? is a project that would be impossible without divine intercession. And in the Cruel Age, the gods are all but gone. Even if they weren't, it's doubtful that they'd have greenlit a project designed to make them obsolete. <laughs> Lagarde needed Sulphur to perform the necessary misdirection so that he could siphon off power from Rare's remnants unnoticed. It's possible that Sulphur is even the original source of Lagarde's power. The same ritual which brought him back to life is practiced by the Church, who have all turned to worshipping the Fallen One. Oh, wait, who in... Uh, Prehavel ha have all turned to the worship of the only one. The sta status of the church uh, elsewhere is shady, but ultimately unclear, I think. Okay. Mm. And his cronies, however, appear determined to stop logic from being activated. Tunnels 1 and 7 are guarded by sulfur cultists who have yeah. never captured the Bremen soldiers there, and the selector scopes have all been deactivated. If the contestants don't defeat them and reactivate the machinery, logic either won't come online or it will be severely impaired. The answer probably lies in the competing themes of the work. Logic obviously represents an extreme form of benevolent collectivism. Yeah. By networking everyone's minds and serving as a single place to store all of the world's knowledge, logic intends to bring about a paradise, but at the cost of individual freedom and identity. Sulfur, on the other hand, is deeply malevolent, but represents the highest form of individualism. Yeah. Humans are held back by our sense of morality, shame, and fear. While these things are what make polite society possible, isn't it true that those in power tend to simply ignore them and walk over all the others, often while yeah. preaching the values that they lack? The Sulphur Cultist is sort of a Nietzschean Superman, who has shed all of these concerns and has both the freedom and the power to do whatever they want, whenever they want, without regret or hesitation. Needles and Perkala are monsters, yes, but at every second of every day, they are doing exactly what makes them happy because they are strong enough to do it. Isn't that paradise for them? 
Uh, what appears to have nobody happened else. is schism in the Cult of Sulphur. Or maybe that's not the right word when it's always been every man for himself. The Kaiser and the priests of Prehavil would seem to be interested in the greater good. They are totally willing to massacre thousands or even millions to get this done. And judging by Father Hugo, they might even be enjoying their terrible actions. But their ultimate goal would seem to be getting logic online for the benefit of the people who are still alive. They even have the janitor directly involved in the project. Hmm. But these three jerks have other ideas. It's likely that they won't be able to hijack Rare if logic obsoletes him in the human consciousness, so they've raided the tunnels and shut everything down. Kaiser seems to have been aware that the contestants would show, and may have been counting on them to get the telectroscopes back online. The game is chock full of references to other media. Chrono Trigger, Bloodborne, Marilyn Manson, Persona, oh. Jojo, Castlevania, Metal Gear, Silent Hill, Majora's Mask, Lovecraft. I could go on. And these references aren't just there to make you point at the TV like DiCaprio. <laughs> They're a useful tool to signpost thematic elements without having to spell them. Like, hey, why is there a Bloodborne lamp over here? <laughs> it's because Bloodborne is a story about the rulers of a society embracing corruption for the greater good and making pretty much everyone they're trying to help suffer and die in the process. Uh, That's why the lamp is there. Okay. Metamorphosis is the biggest theme on display in Termina. Everywhere, everyone and everything are changing. Habadinen's allusions to Marilyn Manson can't help but bring yeah. Antichrist Superstar to mind. The concept album tells the story of the worm boy, who's abused and mistreated in a world that considers him unfit. Trauma of his situation causes him to undergo a metamorphosis, and he becomes a superhuman figure who takes over the world and triggers an apocalypse. Tune oh, is that all? The worm boys and worm girls of the world. And wouldn't you know it, everywhere we look in the game, we find worms. Samari calls herself a lonely caterpillar waiting to shed her skin. The neighbors are all wormy. Look at the sulfur god's wormy little tongue. Ugh. Here's these half cocoon guys. Wow, look at Marina's moon scorched form. It's called Cocoon. Oh. Then there's the book about Pocket Cat, filled with worm imagery. Similarly, many of the characters are carrying around trauma that threatens to take them to some very dark places. The world, too, is on the verge of a metamorphosis. The age of cruelty is ending, and the information age looms in the future. With all the trauma it took to get here, is it really going to be any better? Or has the guard just kicked off something even worse? Yeah. This game is everything that the first wasn't. It brings all the lovely character interactions and high polish that was missing, and presents a much more approachable product. I love all these goofy little guys. I've never been a fandom person, but I've been devouring fan art for these characters, and it's so cute imagining Karen force-feeding Dan some antidepressants, or Marina carving a sigil into Levi's face on their first date. Oh. You know, normal stuff. Yeah. The setting has changed drastically, totally normal. and the endings take the series in a very different direction. But there's a consistent thematic throughline to both games that smooths over any stylistic inconsistencies. If you have suffered in your life, and you have, whoever you are, you have a home in Habadainen's work. There's much more to dig into, of course. I've had some fascinating discussions about alchemical and demonological symbolism with folks on the Fear and Hunger Discord, and I'm personally really looking forward to see how future additions to the game will expand the story or change my understanding of it. The game could be updated and add more I stuff? I think A is the strongest by far, but it's the least horror-y, so I'm torn. I'm certain that the next game will heavily feature both Logic and the Sulphur God, but just how that will play out is anyone's guess. Or it could also somehow involve, like, bring back, like, Fear and Hunger, the God, as well, because now you have the three-way going on. <sighs> A three-way fight, I mean. Showed all the characters surviving here, but it's doubtful that'll be the case once a sequel establishes some sort of canon. For now, that's that. Ugh. I'll cover expanded content as it gets released, and I may release another video or two on specific aspects of the games, but I hope I've done a decent job explaining the broad strokes of what happens in Fear and Hunger 2. Oh, God. That was something. And I, let me just take a look. Yeah, um, my raw footage is three and a half hours long. Great. I'm going to have, this is going to be so much fun to edit down. Oh, God. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to look through her channel, see if there's any more stuff on like Fear and Hunger that I, that I could uh, watch. Because th honestly, this universe is absolutely fascinating. Oh, but yeah, I'm going to have to call it here. Otherwise, I'm afraid my computer might break trying to actually, you know, figure out this, this, this one video file. So yeah, uh, so I, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. 
Goodbye.